This video presentation is about electricity as a part of our first topic, basic circuitry. Electricity is a form of energy, an electrical energy. It is also an energy carrier, meaning that electricity can be converted to other forms of energy such as mechanical energy and thermal energy. But it is more familiar to us as the energy that powers our electrical appliances such as our refrigerator, washing machine, television, and others. Electricity is defined as the flow of electric charge. And since we have learned that protons are usually fixed inside the nucleus, electricity is actually the movement of electrons between atoms. What therefore is electric charge? Electric charge is a fundamental physical property of matter because, as you already know, all matters are composed of atoms. And atom is composed of neutron, proton, and electron. The smallest units of electric charge exist with the electron and the proton. Electron carries one unit of negative charge and proton carries one unit of positive charge. Therefore, objects that have excess amount of electron are said to be negatively charged and objects that have excess amount of proton or more appropriately lacking in electron are said to be positively charged. The electric charge causes objects to have an attractive or repulsive force towards one another. We will further discuss this force later in this presentation. Electric charges are measured in the SI unit of column. One column is equal to electric charge of 6.25 times 10 to the 18th electrons. Therefore, one column is equivalent to electric charge of 6 quintillion to 150 quadrillion electrons. Electrons are used because electricity, as discussed earlier, most often result from their movement. One electron thus carries a charge of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 column. This is probably a more useful value and the one that you have to remember. There are two types of electricity, the static electricity and dynamic electricity. Static electricity is the result of an imbalance between negative and positive charges in an object. These charges can build up on the surface of an object until they find a way to be released or discharged. This build up is sometimes manifested when we feel the jolt when we walk through the carpet and open the door during a cold, dry day. We have also seen its effect in a Van de Graaff generator open during a trip to a science museum. The Van de Graaff generator produces excess electrons on its sphere. When you touch the sphere, the electrons are transferred to your body. When they reach the end of your hair, the repulsive property between electrons causes the hair to move away from each other and stand out. Static electricity is also the reason for your bad hair day. The study of static electricity is called electrostatics. An important in the study of static electricity is the non-contact electrostatic force that is exerted by two charged objects. Electrostatic force follows certain principles. Like charges repel and unlike charges attract. If I have two positively charged objects, or for this illustration, say two spears suspended in a string, and brought them closer to each other, the similar charges of the two objects would cause a repulsive force against each other and will push each other apart. In the same way, if I have two negatively charged objects or spear, and brought them closer to each other, again, 
their similar charges will cause a repulsive force and will push each other apart. On the other hand, if I have two objects of different charges, one that is positively charged and the other one that is negatively charged and brought them closer together, their opposite charges will cause an attractive force to act with each other and therefore bring the two spheres closer. The next principle states that the electrostatic force between two charges is directly proportional to the product of their quantities and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. This is the Coulomb's law. And there are two important characteristics that determines the strength of the force of interaction between two objects. The first is the product of the quantities of their charges, and the second is the distance between the charged objects. Let me illustrate this. As we already know, two objects of the same charges that is brought closer to each other would repel each other. What if? The number of charges between the two objects were increased from one charge each to two charges each. When brought closer, their repulsive force would be greater. Let me further explain the effect of the product of the quantities of charges to electrostatic force. For illustration purposes, let us say that the electrostatic force is equal to the degree of angulation the sphere that is suspended in a string travels. If I have two objects, each with a single charge, and therefore a product of one, causes the objects to be repelled and travel at a total angle of 30 degrees as illustrated in example A. When the quantity of the charges was increased to two charges each, with the product of four charges. The increase from one to four means that the electrostatic force will also increase four times. And therefore, in the example B, objects were repelled at a total angle of 120 degrees. Remember that I have just equate the force to the degree of angulation to illustrate the Coulomb's law. Now, we illustrate the effect of distance on the electrostatic force. So again, if I have two objects of similar charges were brought closer together, their similar charges would repel each other. What if I further decrease the distance between them and bring them even closer to each other? The force of repulsion would even be greater. Let me further explain the effect of distance to electrostatic force. Again, we will use the degree of angulation to illustrate the magnitude of electrostatic force. In example A, the two objects with the same charges are brought at a distance of say 2 cm from each other and exhibit a force which causes the spear to move away, creating a 30-degree angulation from its original position. Coulomb's law state that the electrostatic force between two charges is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. It means that if I cut the distance in half as illustrated in exposure B, there would be greater force of repulsion between the two like charges, equivalent to four times its original value. Therefore, the original angulation totaling 30 degrees would increase four times to 120 degrees. Remember that the force is equated to the degree of angulation just to illustrate the Coulomb's law. As you can see, the electrostatic force exhibited by the two objects is a non-contact force, meaning that even without touching each other, the force of either repulsion or attraction still exists between them. 
How is it possible? This force becomes possible because there is a field that surrounds each electric charge and that is the electric field. The electric field is a vector quantity, meaning that it has both magnitude and direction, which is already defined in Coulomb's law. The electric field direction points straight away from a positive point charge and straight to a negative point charge. Thus, the electric field is always directed away from the positive source and toward the negative source. The other type of electricity is the dynamic electricity. Dynamic electricity is the steady flow of electrons or the continuous flow of electrons from atom to atom. It is otherwise known to us as the electric current or simply electricity. If the study of static electricity is electrostatic, the study of dynamic electricity is called electrodynamics. For us to understand dynamic electricity, we have to understand how electrons can travel from atom to atom or how electrons are conducted. Remember that the same principle of electrostatics applies in charged particles. Unlike charges attract, like charges repel. Therefore, electrons in the more remote orbitals experience less force of attraction from the nucleus and are also repelled by other electrons and so is said to be more loosely bound. Furthermore, in a solid material where atoms are compact and closer together, orbital electrons are influenced by the proximity of neighboring atoms. In this condition, electrons are no longer in discrete levels, but now within bond of energies. The outer two bonds are the valence bond and conduction bond. Separating the two is the forbidden energy gap. For you to be able to picture the valence bond and the conduction bond, let me interface it with our illustration of atom. The inner bonds are the bonds occupied by inner shell electrons. Electrons here are not free to move around or leave the energy level, unless a very strong external force acts upon them, such as during the ionization of atom. The valence bond is actually the outermost shell and occupied by the outermost shell electrons. This bond may be partially or fully filled by the allowable number of electrons. Since electrons in this bond are loosely bound, when provided with sufficient energy, they can become free electrons and move to conduction bond. Conduction bond is therefore filled with electrons that are free to move and are responsible for conduction. Separating the two bonds are the forbidden energy gap or Fermi energy level that exists depending on the type of material. Just to recap, valence bond is the bond which contains the outermost electrons of the atom while the conduction bond contains the electrons that have become free from their original atoms. Valence bond may be fully or partially filled with permitted number of electrons, while the conduction bond may be empty or partially filled. Valence bond is located below the forbidden energy gap, while the conduction bond is above the forbidden energy gap. Valence bond is in a lower energy state, while the conduction bond is in a comparatively higher energy state. The ability of electrons to jump from valence bond to conduction bond depends on the type of material. And therefore, materials can be categorized according to their ability to conduct electricity. 
There are three types of electrical materials, conductor, insulator, and semiconductor. Conductors are materials that readily allow the flow of electrons. They have large number of electrons in the conduction bond. This is because in this kind of materials, the conduction bond overlaps the valence bond, and therefore, electrons in the valence bond can easily jump to the conduction bond or vice versa. Most metals are good conductors such as iron, copper, even silver and gold. Other materials such as water and the human body are also conductors. Insulators are the exact opposite of conductors. These are materials that will only allow electrons to flow in extreme conditions. They have no electrons in the conduction band. This is because in this kind of materials, a large gap exists between the conduction and the valence band. And therefore, electron in the valence band cannot jump to the conduction band. Materials that are good insulators are rubber, wood, glass, oil, and even diamonds. The last material are the semiconductors. These materials are somewhat in the middle. Under some conditions, semiconductors behave as an insulator and in other conditions behave as a conductor. In this kind of material, a short gap exists between the valence bond and the conduction bond. But under certain conditions or through doping, these materials can be made to conduct electricity. Examples of these materials are silicon and germanium. Most modern high-powered electrical appliances use semiconductors. We are going to cut our presentation at this point because the video becomes very long. Please watch part 2 of this presentation. Thank you.